This is Ed Petke with the Americans in Wartime Experience. Today's date is May 11th, 2023. I'm conducting an interview with Mr. James Austin Gray II in Washington, D.C. Sir, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and where you were born, where you grew up? Uh, born and raised uh, near Baton Rouge, Louisiana, grew up there. Uh, went to Atlanta, Georgia for college. After college, I went to OCS uh, in the Marine Corps and um, spent three years in the Marine Corps, which included a uh, trip to Vietnam. Do you have any other military veterans in your family? Plenty of them. Plenty of them. Too yeah. many to list. It's too many lists. Actually, with a cousin of mine, um, we're doing a list and a little book, and we up to 114. Wow. It's, uh, it's a bunch of us. So it's safe to say military service is in your blood. <laughs> uh, it's safe to say that if you're in rural North Louisiana and they tell you that there's a place you can go eat all you can at every meal, <laughs> when you go in the woods, they give you all the bullets you want to shoot. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people did that out of my family. And how, how far back in, in, in our war's history do you affect Well, in, in that list with that cousin we're working on is really just one side of my dad's family. Mm -hmm. There's one Civil War veteran. Oh, wow. Um, I think two or three World War One, a, a gap in there. Sure. And uh, a bunch of um, World War Two, Korea. From then on, it's steady. What made you choose the Marine Corps? Well, first, what made you choose military history, military service? Um, as a kid, I grew up around my daddy, my uncles. Uh, three of my uncles were, on my daddy's side, were Korea servicemen. And uh, my favorite uncle was Korea Army. And he'd come home every once in a while with a pretty uniform on, shiny boots, bunny in his pockets, mm -hmm. and stories about <laughs> the world I hadn't seen. and. I wanted to go see that world. Okay. And what made you choose the Marine Corps? Uh, I came close to joining the Air Force, mm -hmm. so close that um, I was with an Air Force recruiter taking me out to dinner to celebrate the fact that uh, I had been accepted into a flight school in the Air Force. Mm -hmm. uh, but in the Air Force, you, you, you took the tests before you got sworn in, and they waited until they knew you were going before you had to get sworn in. So I hadn't been sworn in yet, and uh, but the recruit took me out to celebrate. And uh, it was late, and he said, hey, look, won't you come in Monday and sign? We stop I take you home. We stopped at a stop sign. A Marine crossed the street. The Air Force recruiter said, I wondered if I could have made it as a Marine. That's Friday night. Saturday, there's a Marine recruit on base, on campus. Mm -hmm. uh, I really went and got my roommate, who was militant, anti-war, mm -hmm. to go harass the guy. And we went and harassed him. But he was very cool, very calm. I was impressed with him. And Monday morning, instead of going to the Air Force, I went. Broke that airman's <laughs> heart, didn't you? I never saw him again. I don't know how he <laughs> felt about it, but uh, I went. To, uh, st and I had to start the process because I went to OCS, but mm -hmm. you know, you, you had to take the tests and all that stuff over. Right. Uh, they didn't just take were the Air Force. Specific, or just because you were going to switch it was, services? I don't know. I don't remember the test well enough to know if the Air Force test was different from the Marine mm -hmm. test. Okay. But even though I had taken the Air Force test and had passed, the Marine Corps required me to take another test. So having gone through OCS, you enter as an officer? I went, well, OCS, you become an officer right. at the end of OCS. Uh, and then you go. Would that have been? Well, you start as a private. If you d finish, you get second lieutenant, second lieutenant at the end of OCS. Mm -hmm. uh, Marine Corps sends everyone to basic school, which is about six months. And at that time, they were sending everyone to Vietnam mm -hmm. when basic school was up. Okay. And you went to the basic school where? Quantico. In Quantico? So this is in 67 to 67. start. So you're already, you've already heard about Vietnam. You already know what's going on. I, I, yeah, I, I was joining to go to Vietnam. So you joined specifically because you wanted to go over. Correct. So what, what does OCS, and, and for, for those who don't know what that is, what does OCS stand for? 
officer candidate school. Okay, and, wh and what does that entail? <clears throat> For the Marine Corps, it's basically just a physical fitness school. Okay. Uh, you, you, you have some written exams and things of that nature, but for the most part, and the biggest problem in OCS is to undergo the physical conditioning that they require. Okay. Um, and, and then if you do that and graduate and get commissioned, then you go to what we call the basic school, which is infantry training. Mm -hmm. And in the Marine Corps, everyone trains as an infantry officer, even if you're going to have a different MOS. So all Marines, if they go through OCS, there are other ways to get commissioned. Is OCS, then the basic school. Okay. If you're doing some specialty, you go to some other school, but uh, I was in infantry, so after infantry school, I went to Vietnam. Okay. What, what's, what's, different, what's, the, what's different between the basic school and the OCS training? Well, OCS, I said, was 90% physical fitness mm -hmm. and while there is some physical component to the basic school you start learning stuff you uh, we learn to shoot we, we went to the rifle range in OCS but uh, you, in basic school you learn tactics you learn other other war. weapon systems how to go to war yeah, um, okay. yeah and how long is that school six months, six months. Okay. so it, you knew after you got out of the basic school, you knew you were going to Vietnam? I requested infantry, uh, and at that time, a third of the Marine Corps was in Vietnam, so... And if you requested it, they weren't going to turn you down? No. Uh, uh, well, the truth is, in the Marine Corps, infantry is sort of elite mm. unit, and everyone who requests infantry doesn't get it. Okay. I mean, we have other jobs in the sure. Marine Corps other than infantry, but... I finished high enough in my class, I knew I was going to get what I asked for, mm -hmm. and uh, I asked for infantry. I don't know, I don't remember having to make a request about where you go, right. but everyone knew everyone was going to Vietnam. Right, right. Okay. Where, where did you, uh, where did you uh, fly out of the United States from? Uh, Pendleton. Yeah, we, Pendleton. We went to Pendleton, I think we stopped in... Um, I don't know if we stopped in Hawaii or not, mm -hmm. but uh, I was at Okinawa, and you spent a couple of days at Okinawa, and then I was in, in country. Did you have any expectations or, or preconceived notions or any idea of what <laughs> may be ahead of you on the other side of that plane ride? Um, I, I, no, not I didn't have a realistic expectation. Okay. Um, like I say, uh, I, I knew my uncles, I knew my father. Um, uh, my father had gotten a Bronze Star in World War II. He was in the Army. Uh, I, I knew my uncles who were career servicemen. I knew my other uncles who had done some time in World War II. No one had really talked about combat as such. Mm -hmm. And so my combat experience was based on the movies. Okay. And, uh, and, and that was all I really knew, mm. is what you see in uh, sure. the movies. And we, as glorified as that may be, uh, when it actually happens, I'm sure it was, it was, this isn't what I saw in the movies. It's not what you saw in the movies. Right. Um, my father actually died while I was in OCS. And because and my father didn't encourage me to go to the military, we didn't much talk about it one way or the other. But he didn't discourage me either. Mm -hmm. And um, he died when I was in OCS. Uh, I often say the first fight I saw in Vietnam, I was not in, but I could see it. I was on a hill. There was a hill across the way, close enough for us to see, but too far away, being infantry, for us to do anything but watch. And uh, I could see it was a tough fight. I could see people getting killed. And uh, I, I, I now say, I said to my dad, Daddy, Daddy, why didn't you warn me? <laughs> Why, why did you, I know you love your baby boy, why did you let me do this? Because uh, it becomes very real very quick. When I saw that, I realized the movies had misled me. Mm -hmm. um, and even though, I, like I say, I'm a good little ways away, mm -hmm. but I can see in here. And, but you know what's going and on. And I can see what's going on, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. what, what, uh, what unit were you attached to? 2-4, uh, 2nd Battalion, 4th Marines. And uh, I was Fox Company 2-4. Okay. 
uh, we were a what the Marine Corps calls a BLT at the time, mm -hmm. a battalion landing team, which theoretically meant we were sent where the roughest fighting was. But theoretically, once it was over, you came back to the rear and mm -hmm. drank beer and ate steaks <laughs> until next time. Okay. Uh, they kept the promise on the first part of the theory, <laughs> but, not the, but not the other half. <laughs> Where's all the steak and beer I heard about? Right. <laughs> Do you remember, uh, where did you land when, what was your first landing point in Vietnam? I guess it was in Da Nang, and uh, then we went to Dong Ha. We, we landed in the big plane in Da Nang. Mm -hmm. I think we flew to Dong Ha, which is not that far away, but you know, there was a house territory in between, and sure. it was easier to go by a uh, plane. And uh, then I went into the bush, and, and when I left the bush, I was on my way home. What, uh, how, how, so how, how, uh, how long, be, when, when you go into the bush, as you say, what, what's a typical time frame that you're supposed to be on a patrol, if there is one? Well, I don't know if there is one. First of all, you're on a hill, okay. and, and the Marines have um, cleared the vegetation off the hill. They've dug holes, mm -hmm. and, um, and, and you're out there on the hill, and on our hill, we had a company which should be close to 200 people, but they had taken casualties, so they were under strength. Mm -hmm. We also had a battery of 155s on our hill, okay. which is artillery pieces. And, um, and every day you would run patrols around your hill mm -hmm. just to make sure no one's sneaking up on you, right. doing anything. And those patrols, for the most part, you, you, you don't expect to bump into anything mm -hmm. big. Then, every once in a while, they'll take you on an operation okay. where they'll take a bunch of companies, put them together, and go somewhere. So you're not just going out to see if you find something. You have a specific directed objective when you do one of these. Uh, on the daily patrols, your objective right. is to make sure no one's sneaking up on your hill. You're, you just right. patrol in the area around your hill. Then when you go on an operation, there is a specific objective. You go into an area where, for some reason, the, the higher-ups believe you will find the enemy. And, um, and, and, and there you expect to have a, a big fight on the patrols. You might get ambushed. Or it might be a sniper, but you don't expect to have a big fight on the little squad-sized mm -hmm. patrols around the hill. And, and how, how big would a squad-sized patrol be? patrolling around this hill? Well, a squ again, a squad should be about 13 men, mm -hmm. but we were under strength, and typically six, seven people in the patrol. And how long would that be? Um, I mean, that patrol was just a matter of hours. Uh, it depends in part on how slowly you moved. I moved real slow. <laughs> Uh, you would be told to, to go out of your lines at one point and go around the hill and come back in the lines at another point. Okay. And, um, and I thought I was a good old country boy used to the woods and knew how to move in the woods without getting, um, excuse me, you know, without letting people know you were there. Sure. And, and to do that, you have to move slow. Okay. You, you have to be careful when you move. And I was, I was, I was that. Mm -hmm. And it's a, very, it's a very different kind of woods than you're used to, uh, I would imagine. It was thicker woods, but I'm from South Louisiana. Our woods are pretty thick, too. Mm -hmm. but, but there's the jungle there was even thicker right. than our swamps. And, and, you know, people talk about... Oh, go ahead. And I was about to say, and, and where I'm from is swamps in Louisiana. Mm -hmm. That's high country up there. Uh, there, are, there are hills mm -hmm. and things, so it's it's a different terrain. Um, pe people I, I've you know spoke to over there, they talk about the rain. Well, again, South Louisiana gets a lot of rain. Yeah. That wasn't the shock. It wasn't a shock. It wasn't a shock to me. The the heat and the rain was. 
was almost not like being home. almost like being home. Um, so, how many of these patrols would you say you, you had gone out on? Well, I didn't go, I didn't have to go, I mean, I didn't have to go every time. Uh -huh. I was the guy in charge and I could send folks. Mm -hmm. uh, when I first got there, I went every time for a little while because uh, I'm new. I don't know my people, they don't know me. Sure. And, uh, and, and you can't be new and send other people out and you sitting in the rear. Right. Uh, you gotta be a lead by the, from the front. Kind you of have thing. to lead from the front, but uh, so I would say, uh, and actually, probably we were there only about ten days before we went on an operation. And I would say that first ten days, I, w I went on patrol every day. Okay. And so, as long as it took you to get from point A to point B, that was your patrol. Yeah. Now you 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 needed to get back before it get dark. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because so you. You know, you're outside the lines. Now, although everyone knows you're, everyone knows we are running Marine patrols around the hill. Mm -hmm. But you ha also have people sitting around the hill, mm -hmm. nervous and all yeah. of that. So you, one of your problems is you don't want anyone else to think you the enemy okay. and shoot at you. Uh, and so you always get back before dark. If you, on a patrol now, you, you, uh, I never really w was did do, did what they call the listening post, mm -hmm. which is just you put a man out uh, in front and he is listening. But the idea is, if anyone's approaching, he would detect them before. You're the early warning. He's the early He's warning the early guy, warning, yeah. and um, um, uh, I, I did go get. We had a guy on the listening post who got shot one night. And um, I went to get him. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, he was wounded and somebody had to bring him back up the hill. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I went with the people who went to get him. The listening posts are normally two men out there. And, um, and one of our two men got shot one night. Mm -hmm. So if, if, if these patrols are generally daytime patrols, what happens at night? You and your whole, go I mean, you still, you still have the listening posts out. Mm -hmm. And you're taking turns watching, watching okay. all night. And uh, uh, someone, someone stays awake. You're spread around. Now, we're not in the rear. In the rear, you're in the city where, mm -hmm. I guess no matter where you are, someone is out watching. Yeah. But if you're in the rear, you could have a lot of people in the back and a few people out watching. Um, in 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 the bush, uh, everyone's sort of involved. Uh, you just have a few people on the listening posts, but uh, for the most part, at every location, someone is awake all the time. Right. Okay. And you they you know someone sleeps you sleep in shifts and mm -hmm. do the night. Did you uh, take part in any combat operations? Yeah. Yeah, you spoke about you went out on this on, on a mission. Uh, yeah, I would call it an operation. operation yeah, we okay. uh, operation. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about that operation? Uh, objective where you went. I don't know. I mean, I we were going to an area. I don't know what the area was. We got on choppers. We flew somewhere. Got off the choppers. Um, uh, it had been a hill that. Um, Americans had been on where we landed before because they had American barbed wire up there. And uh, one of the little incidents, our translator, who uh, was a Vietnamese guy, and um, he and I probably had a little special friendship, um, uh, maybe because I was black and he was Vietnamese and everybody, uh, the other guys were white, the other officers were white. Um, it may be because he had a newborn baby girl and I had a newborn baby girl and, and we had some similarities there. But at any rate, um, as I recall it, somehow even though he was assigned to us, we didn't really control him. Yeah. And he didn't want to go on that operation. Mm. And he said he wasn't going. And 
I, you know, pitched a fit saying, I'm going, you going, you know, right. <laughs> we're in your country fighting for you, what are you doing? Uh -huh. and, and he went, you know, after I fussed at him, he went. Mm -hmm. And, um, but he was a little guy, and, you know, the, you, you go in, the choppers come down, you jump out the choppers, and the choppers take off right away. They don't really land and let right. you get out. And um, he stumbled as he came out the chop and rolled into the barbed wire and got himself all cut up. And, um, and but we were having contact, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, I, I was somehow separated from my corpsman. Uh -huh. And I told another corpsman uh, who, I, I mean, I didn't know him, but he wasn't my corpsman and he was with us. So mm -hmm. he was a Marine corpsman uh, with one of the other platoons, I guess. And um, uh, I told the corpsman to take care of the guy, and, and the corpsman uh, said, Lieutenant, I have Marines who need help. And uh, saying that the Vietnamese guy was not mm -hmm. a Marine that didn't come first. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and I said, you know, take care of this man. Right. And, and I went on off, and, and actually that's the last time I saw him. Wow. And he wasn't going to die. I mean, he was just mm -hmm. cut. Okay but he was bleeding. Mm. Did, you guys, did you guys typically take Vietnamese out with you, either as translators or as scouts? Uh, or uh, well, on the little patrol, the Vietnamese wouldn't go, but on the big operation, yeah, mm -hmm. you'd have translators. We didn't, we didn't have, not with us, we didn't have scouts, mm -hmm. but we had trans. well, I say translators. We had that guy. Okay. That guy that was guy. assigned to our company. I assume other companies did the same thing, but sure. I'm not talking to the other companies. Uh, we're all, about your own. you're all isolated out in, sure. on your hill, and and, uh, and and I didn't spend time socializing. It's, it's a hill in the jungle. I get a piece of the hill that's my perimeter, mm -hmm. and there are other lieutenants and other platoons with other pieces right. of the hill, except that the captain would call us every morning for... Um, you know, briefing and orders. Mm -hmm. You didn't spend time socializing. You spent time, and we had just gotten there. So I said there were holes, but the holes were not adequate. We are digging holes, clearing mm -hmm. fields of fire, um, preparing your side of your hill right. to defend it. So you're not you're not having to worry about an entire hill. It's just your piece, I and all together, the whole hill gets defended. Yeah, I'm not worried about my whole hill. The captain is. Yeah. There, I, I trust the other folks for taking care of their part, and I'm taking care of my part. Mm -hmm. and, and, I'm, and the captain, of course, inspects all of us, right. but, but I don't go with him right. to see if the guy on the other side of the hill is. You have to trust that that's I happening. trust, and, and I, I, I assume I trusted that. I never crossed my mind that the other guy wasn't doing his part. Right. And, and that one operation, um, the big operation, I can't even tell you how many people were involved because, again, I'm in the jungle. You only see mm -hmm. from over there to over there. Right. And, and uh, you know, you get told in the briefing what you're doing. I don't remember specifically what the overall operation, I mean, objective was. We, at least a battalion size operation, was moving through an area, and uh, and we did have contact. Okay. And how, how do you recall how long that operation took? Uh, I was medevac on about the uh, fourth day. Okay. So leading up to that fourth day, um, are you getting into little skirmishes here and there, or there's there's yeah, I mean there's contact, yes. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and, and I would say, I mean, anytime some, they're shooting around you, you think it's big, but uh -huh. we were not taking casualties like other people were. Okay. So uh, at people in the overall thing, there were people taking some serious casualties, but in my little area, mm -hmm. we were not. Okay. And you probably feel like everybody in that jungle is shooting at you. 
if you hear gunfire, you think it's <laughs> at you. At you. It's, uh, it's all for you. It was sort of interesting, uh, and I don't even remember, in one of the presidential campaigns, someone jumped on some candidate who said he was in a fight, and mm -hmm. somebody else said, well, you weren't really in the fight. They weren't shooting at you. Well, that's nonsense. Mm -hmm. If you were out in the jungle and people are shooting in, in your general direction or they're shooting at your people, yeah. You think they're shooting at you. Now, whether or not there's a bullet hitting next to you or not, right. uh, that may be a little different, but, but you think everyone's shooting at you. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Now, you, you mentioned that you were, uh, you were medevaced out. I was not wounded. I got sick in Vietnam. Okay. Uh, I happened uh, to, if you're a doctor, I, I have uh, phosphate 6 dehydrogenase deficiency which okay. means I probably have African ancestry. Okay. And, okay. And, and I have what is a sort of natural resistance to malaria. Oh. But uh, my blood chemistry is such that when I take the medication that other people take to prevent malaria, the medication itself is harmful to me. Okay. No one knew that at the time. And, and when everyone I, got malaria pills. And everyone got malaria pills. And at first, I probably was not taking my pills. I was too busy. Stuff was happening all the time. But then an order came down that every day the lieutenant had to see every man put a malaria pill in his mouth. Because a lot of guys were catching malaria. And um, the, the thought from the higher ups was that people weren't taking the pills. Okay. And they were probably right, because I wasn't taking mine. Right. at that point. But when the order came down, I started taking mine. And almost immediately I got sick. Mm. But then I said, oh, I'm, I must be catching malaria. And if one pill is good, two ought to be great. <laughs> oh. So I started doubling up on the pills, not knowing it was the pills making me sick. Making worse. Oh. So where do you get medevac to back to? Uh, well, there's a couple of stops along the way, but um, uh, I was met back with a bunch of people, and depending on how bad they were, depending on how far they ended up. Mm -hmm. So you stop at the first place, someone does a triage, mm -hmm. and the people who are a little bit worse, they send a little bit further back. And I and one other guy got all the way back to the rear. Mm -hmm. um, to I ended up on a hospital. Well, I didn't go straight to the hospital ship. I ended up on a ship. They transferred me from that ship to a hospital ship. I don't remember the first ship's name, but the second ship, I think, was the Sanctuary, USS Sanctuary. And, uh, and that's where I was until they medevaced me back to the US. United States of America. Now, ha had they known that you had this deficiency before you went in, would that have prevented you? Yeah, but I don't think the military knew about it. Uh, it's, it's sort of a... And I don't even know if they test for it now, but they didn't test us for it. Right. It's sort of a thing that all blacks don't have. Mm. Some do, some don't. I just happen to be the ones, okay. one of the ones who do. And it was not something we were tested for. And in fact, no one knew what the problem was, what was the cause of my problem, until I was back in the States. Okay. And, and I'd been back in the States three weeks before some doctor came in and said, we found out what the problem is. Oh, wow. And um, and like I said, my first thought was I had malaria. Right. Uh, most, a lot of people, a lot of people would catch malaria sure. and the symptoms were somewhat similar. Okay. Uh, now, um, I don't know what the Marine Corps does. I don't know what the Army does. Uh, as a routine matter, do they test every Marine mm. for this? Uh, but. It's a fairly unusual thing, and in fact, uh, even many black doctors at the time didn't know what it was. Oh, wow. okay. um, and when the doctor at Pensacola, that's where I ended up in the hospital, found out what the deal was, he had never seen it. He wanted me to bring my mom and my daddy so he could test them oh, wow. because, uh, you know, uh, he, he, yeah. hadn't, he hadn't seen that many cases like mine. Okay. Now, of course, I told you my daddy was dead, and um, 
I wasn't interested in getting my mom to come let them run tests on us, so we never did that. Okay. Um, is that something that you've had an issue with since then, or was it just because of the pills, the uh, malaria pills? I, I have, well, first of all, uh, a couple of things happened. The, the striking thing, the thing that got me out of Vietnam is it turns your urine red. You know, a little like you're peeing yeah. blood. Uh, which is strange. Which, which is striking. But, but probably before that, uh, you're sleepy and you're tired because it's breaking down red blood cells, so you're anemic. And I thought I was in great shape, but all of a sudden I'm running up these hills and I'm getting tired and mm -hmm. other people not getting tired. And I, I, was, not, I was not used to that. Sure. Um, I told you about the guy on the listening post who got shot. We went to get him, and uh, there was four of us on the, on the stretcher bringing him back up the hill, and I, I couldn't carry him up the hill. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had to let my people take, you know, I said, look, y'all go ahead and I make sure no one's following us. But my real problem was yeah. I couldn't carry that stretch up the hill mm -hmm. at that point. Um, uh, and there was a smell associated with it. Um, now, since that time, first of all, I know what you can't do. I can't take sulfur drugs. I can't take aspirins. There's a few other exotic things I can't do, which most people don't do routinely, so you don't worry about it. In life, there have been a few times when my urine looked a little dark. That smell that I remember, I could smell that smell. Okay but it always went away quickly and I've never been able to pinpoint what caused it mm -hmm. on the other right. occasions. But, but it was never, you know, it never got. Right, because you certainly weren't taking malaria pills. I, I haven't taken malaria pills right. since, <laughs> so. so that wasn't the problem. Right, right. Uh, and, and, um, uh, and as I, I may go to the VA, um, I've had some strange uh, blood readings over the last few years, which um, I've run the thousand tests and no one is quite clear. And I asked the doctors, you know, I have this condition, could this be the cause? And, and at least the doctors I've dealt with have said, I don't think so. Okay. Um, Before you got medevaced out, how long had you been I was. In I was in... I was where people were shooting at each other for about 30 days. About 30 days, okay. Had you had any occasions to be in close proximity with the enemy? Um, you mean like you and I now? No. Or, I, I never. You know, close enough where you would say, I can see that person oh, I, clearly. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I've, I've been close enough to see people clearly. Um, um, other people have said that there, you know, there was the, the NVA and there was the VC, and there was a difference between the two. Do you... Were you there long enough to kind of have to be able to differentiate between I, I think the about it. I think the, v, the VC got themselves, I think two things. The VC probably got themselves mostly wiped out in Tech 68. Okay. And I'm up in, the, I'm near the, the DMZ. Okay. Up there, they were North Vietnamese regulars. Okay. What, what was your impression of the North Vietnamese soldiers? They're willing to die. Mm -hmm. um, that, that first fight I talked about, um, you could see people were getting killed, and a lot of Vietnamese, North Vietnamese soldiers got killed. And I was impressed with the fact they kept coming. <laughs> they didn't back off. And, right. uh, you know, just to look at it, you would have thought they would have said, this is a bad idea. But no. Now, do you think that's a sense of a, an honor thing, a, a duty to country? You're in my country, or do you think it's something else? I think, um, you know, as a kid, I'm 21 years old, but, but I was a kid at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't think much about, I mean, I wanted to go to fight to see if I was as much man as my daddy, and that was the extent of it. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't think about the morals of it or the ethics of it okay. at that point in time. Uh, in looking back on it and in reading stuff over time and, in, and all of that, I say, well, if someone was in my country and if my leaders were telling me that these people are going to kill you and then they're going to rape your mama and your sister, I'd keep coming too. Mm -hmm. 
And I think that's what they were doing. I think they were protecting their their country. Right. What they saw as their country. Even though the North Vietnamese, you may say, they're from North Vietnam and South Vietnam, but, but it's just a line on the ground that politicians drew. Right. And, and I think they were probably fighting because they thought they needed to fight to protect their families and country. And, and I, I, th I thought they were willing to fight. They were willing to, we killed a lot of them and they were willing to fight. Did you, did you find them a, a formidable enemy? Well, or, or adversary? They, they were willing to fight and that's, uh, I, I felt, for example, everybody used to talk about how good the Viet Cong were with mortars. Well, no one was better th with mortars than American Marines. Mm -hmm. I think we were the best soldiers anywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, I bumped in, I mean, I saw the North Vietnamese, I've seen the Koreans, I've seen British Royal Marines, I've seen French Foreign Legion. There's no one like United States Marines, in my opinion, in terms of both ability and willingness to fight. Mm -hmm. Now, having said that, much of your strategy you are taught assumes that the enemy is trying to stay alive. <laughs> and when the enemy is willing to die, it becomes a real problem. Right. And, and, and there are people in the world, well, I think everyone in the world, if they think they are protecting their wives and their children, are going to be willing to die. Sure. Um, when we were in training and in the Marine Corps, I think they do everything better than anyone else. They have some rough looking Marine to give us a little lecture mm -hmm. every morning before we do anything. And, and one, I remember very well, this dude comes out and he says, gentlemen, in the Republic of Vietnam, they are finding the enemy soldier chained on the battlefield. He has lost the will to fight. Mm -hmm. and, um, and we better get over there, we're gonna miss the whole thing. And that's how they talk. And I was anxious to get over there so before I missed the whole thing. Yeah. But I said, wait a minute. Haven't you heard about the American Indians who staked themselves out on the battlefield? Mm -hmm. They would drive a stake in the ground, tie a rope around it, and the other end of the rope around their ankles. That wasn't because they were afraid to fight. That was because they were sending you a message that they had come there to die. Mm -hmm. and Much different message. A very different message. And, and uh, you know, as a little second lieutenant, it wasn't for me to question right. what was being said, except I said, I don't know if that means that. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> and when I got to Vietnam, I don't think it meant that. I think it meant that yeah. they were sending a message to us mm -hmm that we have come here to die. And if your enemy is willing to come to die, he's a tough enemy. They weren't as good with mortars as we were. They couldn't shoot like we could. They couldn't run as well as we could. They couldn't do all the things we were taught to do, but they were willing to die, right. which made them a, a wordy adversary. Sure, plus they had home field advantage, so to speak. They knew those jungles. They knew the jungle, but the woods is the woods, and, and I, I, I felt comfortable in the woods because I'd spent my childhood in a different woods, but woods nevertheless. Right. Um, it wasn't foreign to you. It wasn't yeah. foreign to me. I could look and see vegetation didn't look right and think there might be an ambush there. Okay. Um, you know, I don't know if pe everybody in the world knows that the different size of leaves have different sheen to them. Mm -hmm. And if someone has disturbed the underbrush and turned it the other way, right. it looks different. If you know what you're looking for. If you for. know what you're looking for. And, um, and, 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 and I don't think anyone had an advantage on me in that. Mm -hmm. um, and they probably didn't have an advantage in the terrain because they weren't fighting in their neighborhood. Uh, yeah. I mean, you know, the North Vietnamese were from two or three hundred miles away. Right, right. Uh, but they, I, my, what I say is what I've said five times. Um, they were not afraid to fight. Mm -hmm. 
and that made them a tough enemy. Right. They had that, that will. They had the will to fight. Mm -hmm. Which is sometimes, I mean, it's a lot of times is tougher than, men, than physical toughness. Mental toughness. Oh, without doubt, it's, it's tougher. I mean, and, and I don't know, the Marines, the Marines were willing to fight. They were, but I remember we heard stories about uh, there was some incident where some army unit refused to go up a hill, and 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 I was still in training when that happened. And and that another rough marine talking to us said, "Gentlemen, yesterday in the Republic of Vietnam, the whatever army unit refused orders to go up a hill, and and of course." It was clear to us as Marines we would never do such a thing, right. uh, and I don't think we ever would have. Uh, uh, but but a lot of Americans, but we weren't. I, I say we weren't. I, I thought the Marines I saw did all they could do, and I thought they were the best soldiers over there. But I would tell you after that first incident. I knew it was going to be a long, hard yeah. <laughs> deal, and uh, and I frankly thought then that sooner or later we were going to do what we did, we pack right. our bags yeah, and go home. Go. Um, Just because it, it, it would have been inevitable, I mean, it would have dragged on. We could us. win. We could win every fight, and we would win every fight. Mm -hmm. But if they kept fighting, we right. were going to quit. Yeah. <laughs> We would say it's time to go home, and which America eventually said it's time to go home. Right. What, what, what are your thoughts on that aspect of it? Well, the only anger I have, uh, who's the head of, um, I can't remember the guy's name now, who was Secretary of Defense at the time, uh, McNamara. McNamara. Um, Clearly, we were doing something based on false assumptions. Not false assumptions, because false assumptions mean you intentionally lying, but incorrect assumptions. Okay. And um, <laughs> and I didn't think I would uh, act like this, but uh. A friend of mine, David Garringer, was uh, killed. Uh, um, was killed, and actually, uh, I was back by the time he got killed, and I escorted his body home. Um, and he was um, a crazy white boy who uh, maybe didn't have to get himself killed, but he, he did. And his family... Uh, they celebrated uh, that their son had died for his country. And I was in the outrage with McNamara when he said, oh, it was all a mistake, and we knew it was a mistake at the time. Well, if you knew it was a mistake at the time, let the people come home. A lot of people died after we knew it was a mistake. And that's the anger that I have. Uh, young men join the service because they want to fight and they want to see if they're as bad as their daddies were. And, um, and young men will get killed. And their families are going to lie to themselves about their son dying for a good cause. That's cool. And you shouldn't take that from the family. You shouldn't say, oh, it wasn't a good cause. Which is crazy, because I'm saying, if you mess up that long, if you lie that long, you should quit lying. Mm. At least not to the families and the friends right. of those people. Now, you should learn from your mistake mm -hmm. 
and maybe you shouldn't go to Iraq and maybe you shouldn't go to Afghanistan because maybe you should learn that you can't just go and force your will on people. But um, so I'm a little annoyed that we have not learned from our mistakes. But I'm more annoyed that you will casually be on press conference and say, oh, yeah, it was a mistake. And we sort of knew it was wrong. At Not wrong. He didn't say wrong. We knew at the time we weren't going to win. Right. Well, the moment you knew, then um, every dead man after that right. is your fault. Um, you know, I never... I never dreamed I would do that, <laughs> and uh, I've never done that before. Interesting, but um, you know, and 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 I don't e even get mad with the country for not knowing any better mm -hmm. uh, the first time. Right. But when are you gonna learn? <laughs> better yeah take, take, uh, a, take a take a lesson from history when are you gonna take a lesson from history um, but um I don't know I've forgotten what the question was uh, you asked me and I how, how, we, how you felt about yeah <laughs> I guess I let you know how I felt yeah, about yeah, it yes you did no and that's 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 great I'm most annoyed by how we dealt with it at the end. And this thing about, in the black community, no one spit on us when we came home. No one mm -hmm. called us baby killers. In my neighborhood, uh, my status went up that I was a Marine who had fought in Vietnam. And, mm -hmm. and so you didn't have the negativity or the negative no. reaction? No, there was home. none of that. that there was none of that. Did. Yeah, uh, I didn't see that. Because there was far too much of that. Uh, it was too much of that, but that was mostly a white thing in the white community, and and and, okay. and I wasn't in that environment. I was not getting that. Okay. So, but you you knew it was going on. I mean, and I, I was aware of it. I was aware of it. Marines, and I've taught soldiers. I've taught to guys who who were very much affected by it. Right. Uh, but again, th those guys that I've talked to, I know personally, almost exclusively white Marines, okay. where the environment was different when they came home. Okay. Now, I saw a black guy here today with a shirt on that talked about that. I wanted to get close to him to ask him, did he really see that? Mm. Or was just, did someone just sell him a shirt? Okay, sure. Because uh, yeah. most of my black veterans don't make that complaint. Okay. Uh, that's interesting. I, I had never heard that before. That's, that's an interesting uh, a thought and, and, and a piece of information. I, I, I didn't know that it, it seemed to be, at least in your opinion what, or your experiences. In, 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 in my environment, in my right, experiences, right. which as far as I know ought to be typical, yeah. um, uh, there were people who said you were fool to go because you shouldn't be fighting for America. Okay. Uh, but there were no people who say, uh, you know, you were a baby killer, you were, okay. you, you were this or that. And those people who said you were a fool to go, um, well, my answer, to, I have a couple of answers to them, but one answer is uh, this country is a big system and the truth is you are as much a part of the system as a soldier in a combat zone. If you're pumping gas at the filling station, you are making the process work. Mm -hmm. And 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 if you didn't stop pumping gas at the filling station, if you weren't, uh, if you if you weren't fighting against it, then you were part of it. And 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 it's just that you had a different role. And 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 in my community. Um, if there's a fight going on, you ought to be in the real fight, not right. agitating from the rear. So, so um, I mean, I, I never had a problem 
on that. Right. Okay. Um, is there any one instance, one day, one incident that stands out when you think of your Vietnam experience, you go to that incident or that place or that day? Uh, th there was a little... There was, a, there was one incident that I, I wish I could do it over. Um, of course, I'm not sure what I would do different. Uh, we were on this operation and people were shooting at each other and stuff was going on. And a, a young Marine came to me and said, Lieutenant, what do I do with this? And he had something in the bag. And I, I said, what's that? And he opened the bag and it's an arm that he has in the bag. And he said, this is all I could find of my partner. And I told him, I said, uh, do I look like a corpsman to you? Why are you bringing right. that to me? <laughs> and you don't look like a corpsman to me. You need to put it down and get back in your position. Now he was not in my platoon. Okay. And, and how he got to me, but you know, you're in the jungle, you all mixed up a little bit. And, uh, and he had a hurt look on his face. <laughs> That wasn't the answer he was looking for. That wasn't the answer. He was looking for sympathy, and I didn't give him any sympathy. And I said, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not a corpsman. You're not a corpsman. Put it on the ground right. and get back to your position. And uh, I've often thought maybe I should have been sympathetic to him. Uh, it happened he was a young black Marine. It happened the arm was a black arm. Okay. If it, that would have made any difference. But, um, but the truth is I've thought about that incident. But I'm not sure what I was supposed to say to him because he needed to get back to his position right. so he wouldn't be in the bag. Good point. And, yeah. um, so you probably did the best thing you could for him and tell him, put it down and go. Put it down and go. And uh, he put it down, gave me a hurt look, <laughs> and, and went on back. So you probably never saw that? I never saw, I never saw him again. Did you uh, receive any medals or citations or awards while you were over there? No, uh, I mean the, the routine Vietnamese Service Medal, mm -hmm. National Defense Medal. I did get a Combat Action Ribbon, which you have to get close enough to shoot at somebody and get shot back at to get that. Mm -hmm. But no medals of bravery, anything like that. I wasn't the man my daddy was. He had a Bronze Star in World War II. So I didn't yeah. get, uh, well, I didn't get to that. You did your part, though. I would say, <laughs> you know. Um, do you, um, when you get back? So jumping ahead a little bit, when you get back to um, the states finally, and you're diagnosed and everything, how long do you stay? How long do you continue to stay in the in the, in the military? Well, I'm, I'm I'm in another. I got back to the states. September of 68, okay. I was back in the States. Okay. And um, I was probably in the hospital for about two or three months. Okay. But before Christmas, I was at Headquarters Marine Corps. Mm -hmm. And it's still 68. In 69, I go to um, Camp Lejeune. Mm -hmm. uh, and I go on the med cruise, and I get out in September of 70. Okay. You remember what ship you were on? Ah. It started with an F. Uh, it was no. I used. To, I don't know. I'm surprised I don't remember the ship I was on on the med cruise. Uh, was it? A, it wasn't a carrier. It, no, it wasn't a carrier. Okay. It was a. Um, it was a troop carrier. Okay. It, uh, there was a. It was not a. It was an old one. Okay. Uh, 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 and I don't even remember the destination. There was a, a LPH uh, LST. Mm -hmm. I was on an LST. LST. Okay. A landing ship. I don't know what the T stands for, but there was a. Uh, there was some newer ships in the squadron, mm -hmm. but okay. uh, the I think I was on the Chilton at one time. Okay. Uh, I think that long, was how long was that med cruise? Med cruise was for six months. Six months. 
Would you would you think of it being on the water side than the land side? I prefer land. <laughs> uh, I um, uh, the med cruise. I mean, everybody ought to go on the med cruise. It's you were you in the service? No, my, my 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 son is, and my dad was. He okay. told me about his med cruise. And Everyone ought to get a med cruise. Yes. Uh, I did not. I mean, there's a cruise in the Caribbean which I didn't get, but uh, cruises are nice. Mm -hmm. I say they're nice. I mean, they are nice. Uh, see the world. You see the world. You. Um, I mean, if you complain about you crowding on the ship, you. Yeah. Uh, we had so many people on our ship, everyone couldn't get out of bed at the same time. You had to <laughs> sleep uh -huh. in ships and, wow, and, and yeah. come up in ships. But I went to Spain, France, Italy, Greece. I wasn't going to get to see those places right. absent the military. So um, uh, I was, that was fine. Oh, yeah. And, uh, you know, and I, I, I say, I know some Marines, and when I say the, uh, if you're not in the combat zone, the Marine Corps is, a, is a, the world's greatest Boy Scout troop. I mean, you, mm -hmm. you camp out, you see the world, you have big toys to play with, you, <laughs> you know, it's, it's no better life you could have. Right, oh, sure. A lot, of, a lot of sweeping, a lot of picking up, and well, a, lot of, a, lot of, a lot of marching. A lot of marching, a lot of up the hill, down the hill, yeah, yeah. Um, but, um, it, and you and you know you uh, I, I was except for the for the thing um, I was healthy most of the time I was in the Marine Corps mm -hmm. and I was I was in good physical shape and and, and th they don't run until everyone falls out if <laughs> if you could last until a few people fall out you're good then you're good <laughs> and uh, and I could last until a few people fell out before me and and I was good, uh, so um, so that wasn't. Uh, and and uh, I mean, obviously, uh, one of my regrets is I look back on guys, and and I talked about um, uh, the guy whose body I escorted home. Um, at the time, you didn't know what you were missing in life because you hadn't experienced it. Uh, my life has been very good since Vietnam, and I sometimes feel sorry for those guys who never got a chance mm -hmm. to see sure. even a wife, what could have been. children, grandchildren, um, mm -hmm. and um, uh, but at the time, they, m many of them didn't. They they weren't worried about it. They didn't know what they were missing. Right. It's it's the it's the the bliss and also the curse of youth, where you don't know what you don't know. You don't know what you don't know. And uh, you don't miss what you've never had. Right. Um, and um, for example, in the Marine Corps, in, in South Louisiana, they take shrimp and dehydrate them. And uh, that's a real luxury. It, it was expensive, relatively speaking. and um, and my mama used to get some, and you could only get a few, mm. four or five. Okay. Well, in the Marine Corps, they had bags of that, and you dump it in a container of water, <laughs> and you could, you could eat all you wanted. I mean, I say, man, this is, <laughs> this is better than Scotlandville. They show. <laughs> uh, uh, and I say, uh, would I have gone to Spain? to Italy, right. to, to France, to Athens. No, I would not have. Um, would I, at 21 years old, have, and I, I was married. When I got to Vietnam, I had a wife and a baby. Mm -hmm. But, um, so I thought I was a grown man. But I have, supposed to have 50. I don't have 50 because too many people have gotten hurt, but I have 30 men who live or die on my word, right. uh, I've not had that responsibility since. Um, it's an awesome responsibility, and then put that on the shoulders of a very young man who doesn't, thinks he has a lot of life experience, but really doesn't. 
but he doesn't know he doesn't until right. until he gets them. So at the time, he thinks he's a man, right. and he thinks he's fully prepared for all of that. Um, and, and and of course, once you get and going back to the little guy with the arm, um, I don't know what you do with him. Yeah, he's he needs to go and yeah. do his his job, which right. is defend. We could talk about this other thing after his little piece of the front. Now, uh, he he, I think about him. I don't know who. I never knew his name. I never, and 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 I I, I think about. Could I have been nice to him that day? But I can't think of how I could have been nice to him that right. day. It's, yeah, I mean, it's at a time where nice kind of takes a back seat to duty and task at hand. Mm -hmm. How has, how has your wartime experience affected your life? Um, well, to answer the question I would have had if I hadn't done it, I mean, um, Coming from my family, I would have known. I would have wanted to know what it was like, and I know what it's like. So it answered that question. Um, the military generally, uh, I probably was a better organized, better disciplined guy after the Marine Corps than I was before the Marine Corps. Um, I say, despite what you just saw a few minutes ago, I am little affected emotionally and all of that, I say. <laughs> uh, I, I may lose that argument right now, but um, uh, I, I have been able to function in the world, I think, normally. I have friends who don't, um, and I have friends in two categories. I have friends, I have a friend who cries all the time. And um, but he cries and then he goes to his work and he mm -hmm. he's raised the family and he does everything he needs to do. I have other friends who um, never quite got back in life mm -hmm. after Vietnam. Um, and, and and of my friends who didn't go to Vietnam, some made it okay and some didn't. So I'm not sure what was the determining factor for anyone. So say theoretically 50, 60 years down the line, your great, 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 great grandchild is going to watch this video. What's one thing you would want them to know about your service during the war? That, um, Without regard to the overall wisdom of what the country was doing one way or the other, uh, I cared, I did my share. Mm -hmm. And and you always ought to do your share. And no one is better than anyone else. If anyone has to do it, then you should do it. And and, and for example, I talked about talking to people who, who who say they were against the war. Well, if you were against the war, you should have been demonstrating against the war. You should have gone to jail to stop the war. You can't sit at home and say the right. war was bad. If it was bad, then you shouldn't have let all those people die while they were fighting a bad war. The fact you escaped it is not enough. Uh, you, you didn't do your part if you just sat at home and said it was bad. Um, it would be great if we did not have to go fight wars. Um, and you keep hoping people will get smarter and we won't have to do it after a while, but people don't seem to be getting smarter. <laughs> wow. uh, and, and I fear, I mean, my son is too old to have to go. I have some grandsons. Uh, I would hate for my grandson, I say I would hate for my grandsons to have, to, I say that I don't want my grandsons to get killed in the combat zone. Now, um, I believe even my grandsons are obligated to do their share and, and their share might one day put them at risk 
uh, I wish our leaders would not put my grandsons at risk, but I don't have any confidence that I can depend on them not to do it. Um, uh, and and if even if there's not a war, you still have an obligation. You you still have a role to play in the world, and it's your job to wake up and play your role every day. Uh, I, I I've taught the kids who say, "It's my life. I can do what I want to do," and my answer is, "No, it's not. Uh, you're in a relay race. Someone has brought you the stick." And you have to take the stick to the next guy. You can't decide not to run. You can't decide not to run hard. Right. Uh, it's a great analogy. You owe the people who came before you, and you owe the people in front of you. And now I give that analogy because I coach track. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and interestingly, many, many kids run faster on a relay than they do in individual races. It's a psychological thing. Many kids who in the individual race will give up and say, I can't beat that guy. Mm -hmm. In a relay will say, I got to do my best to get the stick to the person in front of me. Um, and, and, um, and maybe that's, uh, not maybe, I think that's the way it ought to be. If it was an individual race, then yeah, it's your life, you can run as fast as you want to run. But it's not an individual race. You owe the people who brought you the stick, and you owe the people you bring the stick to. Well said, very well said. Is there anything we didn't talk about today that you'd like to document about your, your time? Um, Not really. I mean, it. Um, I will s just say that young men are likely to decide they want to join a group. Now, what group that's going to be depends on where they are, their environment, and all of that. Um, uh, I've been on some. W w uh, not websites, but some email exchanges with guys and, um, and, and on cases of being Marines, uh, I'm in a fraternity and on cases of being with that fraternity. And I've said to them that um, the fraternity in the Marine Corps is really serving the same purpose as street gangs serve some kids. And I've had people get mad with me. And, and in fact, in one case, I hadn't said I was a Marine. I was on there because of the fraternity. There was this Marine who was talking rah, rah, rah. And I never taught rah, rah, rah. And, 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 but I do say one day his Marine Corps and the street gangs the same. And he gets outraged and says, if you had served in the Marine Corps, you would know better. And I said, well, the truth is I did serve in the Marine Corps, and I served in combat. You didn't. I was in infantry. You in motor T. So I can talk about it. Uh -huh. And the truth is it is. But if you don't give that kid the option to be in the Marine Corps or the option to be doing something nice, he's going to find some group of people that he's going to side with and he's going to do what they're asking him to do. And, and, and that might be a street game. Now, families' jobs are to let that be the family right. and not let it be a street game and not even let it be the Marine Corps. And, and I would say, for me, it was always family first. I love the Marine Corps. Mm -hmm. I love a lot of things, but it's family first, then some of those other things, which it ought to be. And in most families, that's a good thing, because mm -hmm. <laughs> in some families, even that's a bad thing. <laughs> Sometimes you tell the kid they need to cut their family loose <laughs> and get away from those yeah, people. Yeah. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Well, 
Well, sir, I'd like to thank you for your service. I'd uh, like to thank you for sitting down and speaking with me to me today. It's been a real honor and it's been a real privilege. And well, really thank you. And I never would have done it if I thought I would have put on that <laughs> show. And uh, but I don't know. I guess what happened happened, and um, and um, such is the way of life.